All right. Uh, do we uh, do we, we already have some fifty people? Uh, maybe we could start doing at least our. We usually have some housekeeping announcements to, to give first, right? And so I will I will try to share my screen here. It's usually Flavio who does that, but today he's you know he's uh, he's organizing the Symposium Brasileiro de Sistemas de Informação, uh, which is our one of our large information systems um, conferences in the the country, and it's happening right now. So today he said that he would be a ghost, he would be around. Just pushing buttons, but uh, wouldn't participate much. In fact, he, he, he's already done uh, some uh, some good participation here. Uh, but anyway, it's usually he who presents the screens and everything. I will try and show my screen here and present a few of these housekeeping announcements. So today we'll, we'll we'll go on with formative constructs, but mainly now from a, a, based on on War PLS, that is uh, a tool that Ned uh, has developed himself, uh, and and which is today one of the tools that people use in structural equations uh, modeling and uh, some other quantitative uh, analysis, uh, he will be able to tell us a lot more about that uh, in a sec, but I just want to go through a few um, um, things about our whole program. First of all, we are right in the middle, right? We had uh, planned for this uh, semester 13 seminars. This is seminar number seven, uh, and I'm glad to, to tell you that we still have a lot of very interesting uh, speakers that will talk to us. Next week, we'll have uh, Ramon Garri Garcia, uh, who's one of the main uh, researchers these days, at least I consider him to be, uh, in the field of smart cities and, and e-government and things like that. Uh, then we'll have, the next week we'll have uh, Gerald Grant, uh, who will be talking about some of the ideas that he has in his book about the value imperative of, uh, in a digital world. Then we'll have Sandra Bobineau uh, from uh, UCAM in, in Canada, talking about co-creation and technology appropriation. Uh, Michael Erskine, uh, talking about geospatial, uh, geospatial uh, reasoning, Adam Videra, uh, talking about uh, the application uh, uh, of IS to crisis management. And finally, uh, and, and every every time from now until our last day, I will say you cannot miss the, the, the 13th um, seminar because it's going to be a surprise seminar with a, for now I'll call a very special guest. Uh, we will not announce him. Uh, it, it's, it's all confirmed already, right? But we will not announce it because we think that we, we need some advertising. We want uh, to close this series of speeches uh, with someone that could possibly give us a, a, an overall idea, an overall perspective of different things that we've been discussing here. I mean, we've talked about methods, application theory, uh, and, and we'll have here someone who's been in our field for, I would say, 50 years plus. Uh, and well, maybe I'm already giving some hint of who, who this person is uh, and uh, who, who has uh, accepted to come and, and talk to us also. Uh, with a very under, very good understanding of the information uh, systems field in, in, in the world um, to provide us with. Uh, so this is uh, our schedule for the next uh, few weeks. Uh, some uh, housekeeping announcements. First of all, feel free to invite any friends or colleagues who may be interested in any of the topics that we're discussing in these uh, seminars. In fact, if you're still thinking of someone that should be here right now, send them a WhatsApp message uh, with the link. Uh, we, we prefer not to have the link in, in public, um, you know, um, I don't know, in, in, in Facebook or, or something like that, because as you've seen, we, are, we use it very democratically. Everyone can open their mics, everyone can open their cameras here, uh, and uh, we, we only want to have people that are really interested in what we're doing, and no one who's going to be a, one of these internet graffiti uh, people that come to just show their show how beautiful they are when they're nude, or uh, we don't want that around. Uh, uh, another thing is, uh, well, we have a WhatsApp group for last minute information. Uh, I, I know that many of you are there. We don't I mean, it's not a group where people will be talking all the time, but it's a group that if we have any problem, anything, we, we, we can share information very quickly. If you want to get to it, you just have this link bit.do, uh, re resis uh, for, for um, uh, our research seminars in information systems, uh, underscore WhatsApp. It will lead you to uh, this uh, page in, in, in WhatsApp. And, and from there, you will be part of the group. You, you, you'll get those messages. Uh, we have many of uh, people that are here with us that are enrolled students, which means that they're taking the seminars for credits. If you are one of those, you have to prepare yourself before uh, the seminars, doing things that we propose there on, on in our Moodle uh, platform. And you have to also usually have some tasks, some, something to do afterwards. So that's basically for those of you who are students uh, at uh, Universidade Federal do ABC or at Universidade Tecnológica Federal do Paraná, uh, either because you, you study there all the time or because you're, you're taking uh, this course there uh, and you, you, you have enrolled for the course. So don't forget, if you're one of those, don't forget you have to go to Moodle. This is the, 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 the link to, to our Moodle. Uh, but in fact, any one of you can go there because we always have, for example, for this topic here on Ned's uh, presentation, we had a few you know papers that Ned has uh, written. We, we even have an interview that I 
I had with the, the, pre the pleasure to, 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 to have with uh, Ned a few years ago. Uh, so we always have some interesting content here that can, can put people into the mood of the, of the research uh, seminar of the day, right? So it's available to everyone. You just have to go there to pit.do uh, slash Hesis. Just pay attention because it's capital letters here and there is a, a small letter in the middle, uh, in all case in the middle. Uh, uh, for Moodle, you need an access code. Uh, it's a very difficult one because we, we don't use cryptography or, or blockchain or, or, or anything. It's just that the access code is one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Uh, certificates uh, available to anyone who's participating here. Uh, I mean, we do this in a in a batch, so it doesn't matter if we have to do 50 or 100 of them. So please, if you uh, if you want to get a certificate for today's um, presentation, just go to bit.io slash lacais, all capital letters, underscore attendance, uh, and we will prepare that and, 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 and send a certificate uh, to you. Uh, of course, all the sessions of these research seminars have been recorded. Uh, they are available at lacais2. If you go to to YouTube, and you just uh, type Lakai's tube over there at the top, uh, all together, it will probably, it already shows you Lakai's tube here as the first uh, option we have. It says, it tells me that we have 43 videos there, but the videos for this series of of, of seminars are all here uh, since uh, we, we have uh, Stacy's uh, presentation last week, uh, Haiza's the week before, uh, Marcelo Fornazin's the week before, and so on and so forth, since the beginning, right? And, uh, and if you have questions to, to Ned, he will probably tell you how he wants to manage them, but some of you will probably just uh, open your mics and, and ask them freely, but otherwise, uh, you, you go to menti, uh, to menti.com. Uh, I will, as soon as I, I pass the, the word to, to Ned here, I will include, include a code in the chat for uh, these, um, for you to, to 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 ask questions there, and those questions will be questions that we will we'll pose at the end of the presentation. If if by any chance Ned prefers to go a different way, uh, he will he will say. Right? This again, uh, some of the the, the papers that are the, the presentation that we ha already have in like I soup. And while Ned is preparing his presentation, there I have to present him more informally. Ned Koch is actually my good friend from when we we were teenagers. Uh, Nereo Florencio Koch Jr., uh, who went to to, to school with me, we were both at uh, Universidade Tecnológica Federal do Paraná. That stage it was uh, CFET, Centro Federal de Educação Tecnológica, here, here in Curitiba. And the, the, the very informal thing that I wanted to, to tell you about is that each time I arrived home after going to a party at two o'clock in the morning, I looked out my window. I lived in, 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 a, in, an, apartment, in, in an apartment building. I lived on the 11th floor and, and, and Ned uh, lived in, in a, a student's house about one block away. I would look out and his light was always on and he was always studying there. I said, damn, I should have been studying here instead of partying. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we've, I mean, we've, we've known each other for over 30 years, 35 years possibly. Uh, and it's, it's an honor to have friends that have gone so far in their career. Ned, the floor is yours. Okay. Can we all see the screen? Yep. Good. Okay. Yeah, that was uh, still uh, right next to uh, Paseo Publico in Curitiba. I'm surprised to hear that you could see inside my room from your apartment. Yes, of course. <laughs> but, uh, it's quite a violation of privacy, I would say. So, anyways, well, uh, you should have turned your your your, your closer curtains there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, okay, so my presentation is Work PLS Informative Constructs. I am at Texas A&M International University. This is a university in the Texas A&M system that is right on the border here between the United States and Mexico in Laredo. This is the outline of my presentation. I will try to make my presentation uh, intuitive and also practical to those of you who want to analyze uh, data with formative uh, LVs. I'll present a, a couple, I'll contrast a couple of different views of formative measurement for you. Uh, and I will start with some conceptual discussion, uh, but I'll try to make it intuitive, like, intuitively appealing. As uh, Alex mentioned, uh, I developed PowerPLS.com. The software has about 10,000 users worldwide, uh, now probably more. Uh, and this is the website for, for the software. You can get, actually download a free trial version there that is good for 90 days on free trial. So structure equation modeling, um, it, typically you have something like this. You have a few latent variables. The latent variables, they are latent contracts that you have in your mind um, if as a researcher, so for example, job satisfaction. And uh, what you would do is you create 
question statements in a questionnaire. Typically, that's what you're going to do in FPM. You create question statements that you're going to put in a questionnaire and that are related to your latent construct that is in your mind. So if it is job satisfaction, you would do question statements of the type, I like my job, my job is great, things like those. And you're going to ask people to answer at those question statements on Likert type scales. And, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the quantification of those answers will be called indicators, which are going to be the direct measures of your LV. Whether it's formative or reflective, uh, your, your latent construct has to be in your mind before you create the question statements. And if a variable A causes a variable B, that variable A has to exist before variable B, right? If variable B is created to measure variable A, then variable B cannot cause variable A. Now, I'm not, I, I know this is maybe a bit different from what you heard from other people, but it's just something for you to keep in mind because if you submit an article to a selected journal, the review panel may take this perspective and want you to align yourself uh, with them, which doesn't mean that you cannot change your mind. You can always say, I am doing this, uh, I'm taking this protect perspective in the paper, uh, but uh, my belief is different. You can even say that in the paper, but you're not going to tell the review panel, no, I don't agree with you. If it is a selected journal, they will just reject your paper. And if you have empirical uh, data, you want to publish. So let's say measuring, let's say I want to measure job satisfaction. Reflective measurement would be characterized by redundant questions of the type, I like my job, my job is great. So these are essentially questions that mean generally the same thing. And you would typically answer them on Likert type scales from one to seven, strongly disagree to strongly agree. Formative measurement, you would, it would be characterized by questions of the type, I like my boss, I like my office, which are non-redundant. They are not redundant. So you may like your boss, but not your office. Whereas if you answer yes uh, or, or strongly agree to I like my job, very likely you answer something along those lines, strongly agree or, or agree to my job is great. So these are redundant questions. That's reflective measurement. Formative measurement, non-redundant questions. Okay, So they, they are designed to measure different facets of the same latent construct. Now, in both reflected and formative measurement, the construct exists in the mind of the researcher before any question is devised. So the, then the questions give rise to the uh, indicators, which are the, the columns in, the, in your table uh, with your data that you will use as indicators of your latent construct or latent variable, in this case, job satisfaction. Now, another example, electronic communication media use. So reflective measurement would be Questions at the time, I use econ media, I use using econ media is important to me. So redundant questions. Whereas formative measurement would be characterized by questions that are non-redundant, such as I use email, I use video conferencing. So they're non-redundant. You may use email a lot, but not uh, video conferencing at all. Again, the constructs have to be in the mind of the researcher to devise the questions. So that construct is the cause, the effect are the indicators here. Um, you're not going to come up with questions to measure economy use of the type, I like my dog, my dog makes me feel good, because they are not going to be used to measure uh, that particular latent variable, latent construct. Is this, does this make sense? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can, we can. Oh, perfect. Okay. Good, good. <laughs> it takes a while for people to turn on their mics or, or, or everyone's sitting there in the chat also that they're they're able to. OK, very good. So uh, one, one thing I wanted to mention, and this, by the way, this is a model that I'm going to show some results for. The model has four latent variables. This would be electronic communication media use. It's a formative variable. Project management. Um, so I, we collected data to test this model from 300 new product development teams in uh, real companies. And these uh, teams, they um, develop new products, like a new car part, for example. So ECM is electronic communication media used by the teams, the, the degree to, the, to which they use in e-com media. Project management is the use of project management techniques by the teams. Efficiency is cost efficiency of the teams, whether the teams are 
are running on time and also time uh, timeliness, but also cost efficiency. So whether they are running above cost or not, uh, and and whether they are they are doing their work in the time that they planned. And success is the market success of the product developed by the team. Uh, developing a new vaccine for COVID would be developing a new product. Uh, so the inner model, what we call the inner model, is this, is the latent variables and their links. Typically, each link would be a, a hypothesis, but you could have a hypothesis, uh, for example, a mediation hypothesis that would rely on the assessment of, uh, of an indirect link. But typically, each link would be a hypothesis. So this is the inner model. The inner model is also called the structural model in SEM. This is essentially what you want to test, right? Your hypothesis that are here. The outer model is the LVs and their indicators. And um, this is also called the measurement model. And typically you want to test your measurement model for quality before you can test your inner model. So if uh, you want to make sure that your measurement model is reliable, is, is, um, is, is good in terms of uh, its quality so that you can trust the test of your structural model. So this would be the outer model, the other would be the inner model, this is also called the structural model, and this is also called the measurement model. Now, uh, if you, so if factors cause indicators, as I was saying before, and you regress uh, an indicator on the factor, you're gonna have a loading. Typically, the loading will be uh, lower than one. If one loading is one, then you don't need the other indicators because that uh, indicator perfectly measures the factor. So, each indicator is caused uh, by the factor, uh, but the, the, the uh, variance explained in the indicator is not completely provided by the factors. It's provided by the indicator error terms as well, which are usually assumed to be uncorrelated. But this assumption is violated when you have common method bias. And common method bias is a big deal in SEM, and it affects both CBSEM as done by Amos, Lisro, uh, M+, and other software and also PLS SEM. So do factors cause indicators? Yes, because the construct's mental representation used by a researcher to develop the question statements in the questionnaire exists before the question statements. Now, if you regress the factor on the indicators, you'll get weights. And uh, if, you, if, the, if no indicator measures the factor with absolute precision, then the collection of indicators will not do the same. We'll, 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 we'll have the same problem. So they are not going to account for all of the variance explained in the factor. The remaining will be this measurement residual or measurement error, whatever you want to call it. But this will emerge from the situation of the factor uh, causing the indicators. And then when you regress the indicator, the factor on the indicators, you get weights and you get an R squared and the R squared is not one. It is only one if you add the measurement error. The factor's true reliability is not the complex alpha or composite reliability. These are measures, but the true reliability is exactly the variance explained or the R squared in the factor that is that are explained by the indicators. Now you have, so the key difference between classic PLS, not factor-based PLS, is that all, all the, the latent variables are, uh, are, are modeled as composites, which means that it's essentially just a, a, a weighted aggregation of the indicators without the measurement uh, residual. This formulation, including the measurement residual, is the one used by CBSCM in a new form of, fact of PLSSCM called factor-based PLSSCM. So that's, that's a new development. Um, and uh, this formulation conceptually is the same as used by CBSEM. So CBSEM is, is what differentiates CBSEM from classic composite-based PLSSEM is that CBSEM assumes that there is a measurement residual and that has to be explicitly modeled in the analysis. So the factor is actually a, combi a combination of a true composite, for lack of a better word, and the measurement residual that explains the variance in the factor that is not explained by the true composite. Now, one thing about this uh, new factor-based BLSSCM approach that I mentioned to you is that you can generate, from composites, you can generate factors. 
and uh, and then do the the uh, the factor based uh, PLS SEM with the same benefits that you would have with composite based SEM. One of them being that you don't have identification problems. Identification problems are common in CB SEM. So in other words, you, with if you have a model in CB SEM like a, 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 a an SEM analysis done uh, via Amos, for example, or M plus or or Lisro. Often, if you have a model that is even slightly more than a, a simple model, more complex, uh, there will be no convergence to results. And uh, with uh, this factor-based PLSSCM, you always have convergence, like you have with classic PLSSCM, or, or almost always. So just to make things clear, each factor is uh, a combination of a composite and a measurement residual. And the measurement residuals in one factor they are correlated with the measurement residuals in the other factor and actually with the, the factor itself. So this is why if you don't consider measurement residual or measurement error, uh, you end up with uh, a attenuation of your path coefficients. Now, so you, you end up with worse results using a composite-based uh, approach than you do with a factor-based approach, generally speaking. So there will be an underestimation of the path coefficients that are real but the, the other problem with classic PLSSCM is that you have an overestimation of the paths that are not real, that are zero at the population level. So in uh, our PLS, you have, uh, you implement actually, the software implements um, PLS-based or composite-based algorithms, and they are the ones uh, here under PLS regression. These are all composite-based. This is what often people refer to as OLS. Ordinary least squares is basically some summing the indicators with the same weight. Um, mode A and mode B, mode B, they're different in that mode A is the reflective mode of classic PLS, and mode B is the formative mode that assumes that indicators cause uh, latent variables. And here you have the factor based algorithms that are uh, implemented by the software. Now, this PLS mode M is, is uh, the one that is usually implemented uh, in, in other software that implement class PLS, classic PLS, in that it, it uses PLS mode A, B, I'm sorry, PLS mode A for reflective LVs and PLS mode B for formative LVs. And you as the user define which, uh, which latent variable is, is, is what type. The, among the factor-based ones, I like this one, Reg2, because it allows for the existence of common method bias. So it assumes that uh, the indicator uh, error terms may be correlated. So here I have uh, my model that I mentioned before, analyzed using PLS-M, which is classic PLS, and PLS-F, Reg2, which is factor-based. So as you can see, the results are similar. So you could say, well, if this is empirical data, which, which results do I trust? Which results are the most correct? To ascertain that, you can actually check fit indices, and you can get to the fit index indices, uh, the, the extended set of fit indices provided by RPLS using this option here, explore additional coefficients and in indices. And I recommend using these four uh, of two of the classic indices group, uh, classic because RPLS in previous versions generated this and, and these uh, indices and the additional indices, which are indicator correlation matrix uh, fit indices, that are similar to the indices generated by CB SEM software. And this one is actually, this one, SRMR, is widely used uh, in CB SEM as a measure of fit. So these, these, are, these additional indices, the SRMR and the SMR, they actually uh, compare indicator correlation matrix uh, matrices, the model implied, which you can always generate if you have the model parameters, that's the path coefficients, the loadings, and uh, then you have the actual correlation matrix, and then you can, com can compare the two. And the closer they are, the lower are these numbers. These are structural model indices, so the average R squared, that's just the average of the R squareds in the model, and this is the average path coefficient, also self-explanatory. Now, these rely on um, measures that are fewer these rely on many more measures. The, the correlation, indicator correlation matrix is probably the richest set of data points that you have uh, in your model. So I would recommend to compare models to use these. And if they are identical for two models, then uh, use these. And the order that I would recommend would be SRMR, then SMAR, then 
ARS than APC. So as you can see, I have an SRMR here of 0 0.098 for my factor model. And here's 0.113 for the, the composite based model, right? With one formative variable in both. And since the, the fit is better here on the right, I can say, I can argue that this is the, the model that I should that, that I uh, that I should trust, right? These are the results that are probably the most correct for this model. Now, formative uh, assessment. So I need to assess my my formative, uh, my, my measurement model, my outer model, in order to trust the structural model uh, coefficients. And I have a formative variable. The, the reflectives we, we would usually assess through a confirmatory factor analysis. The formative, I use something else, which is um, what we're talking about today. Usually you rely on weights, which you obtain through this option, view indicator weights in Warp PLS. And here I have the weights for the one at the top, the, the, the PLS-M, and for PLS-F here at the bottom. So typically, your expectations will be that the p-values for the weights will be lower than 0.05. The VIFs for each of the indicators will be lower than 3.3. And this is based on Monte Carlo simulations, these thresholds uh, that we're talking about here. So the VIF is actually a measure of redundancy. Uh, among the indicators. And as I explained to you before, I don't like, we don't want redundancy in formative variables, right? So we want low VIFs for the indicators of formative variables. Now, the effect size is a measure of uh, the, 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 the contribution of each indicator to the R squared in the LV, right? The formative LV. Now, the effect sizes, they're not very widely used for formative measurement assessment. But they could because they, unlike the p-values, they are not dependent on sample size. So, and the threshold, if you want to use the effect sizes, the threshold would be 0 0.02. So you would expect effect sizes to be above that threshold. And that comes from the work by Cohen on, on power. And the weight loading signs, when they are negative, uh, that means that the loading and the weight for the indicator have different signs. And that is an instance of Simpson's paradox, um, which is has many interpretations, but it's most of the interpretations are not very good. So it, it suggests that there is a problem, which I believe is related to the fact that the, the um, algorithm used here is PLS mode B for the formative variable, for the formative LV, and that algorithm assumes something that, in my opinion, is illogical that the, the measurement, the indicator causes the, the latent variable. So this is why I think you don't have these problems here, but you can have redundancy. So how do I fix these problems? So I'm, I'm gonna look at this one here at the bottom, which is the PLSF one. So what I'll do is I'll remove the highest v in VIF off pair where the VIF is, is greater than 3.3. And I say this pair because often redundancy happens in pairs. As you can see here, so you have, so it's possible that you're going to have only one indicator that will have a VIF greater than 3.3, but typically you'll have in pairs. And what you would do is remove the indicator with the highest VIF first in each pair, and then we do the analysis. And I do that, and you do this because once you remove one indicator or two, then all problems may be resolved. So this is why you should do that one at a time, and then redo the analysis. I'll show you after this uh, how to do that in RPLS. It's very easy. And then, so once you take care of the VIFs, um, and so you would remove this one and this one, and probably all the VIFs would be lower than 3.3. But you may still have p-values that are greater than 0.05. And here, what you do is you remove the indicators with the highest weights first, which happen to be the ones with... Uh, the, the low speed values that violate this rule. So you would be tempted to remove this one first uh, because it has the, the highest p value. The p value is the probability that this indicator doesn't belong here, right? And you want this probability to be lower than 5% by convention. But if they're higher than 5%, you will get rid of the indicators that have the highest weight. Why? Because, and that would be this one first, was message. 
So you would remove email list, web page, voice message, and attach audio. You would remove these and then last ECM board. But as you remove them, you may find that the other problems disappear. So this is why I remove them one by one. But you go with the highest in, uh, weight first because that's the one that affects the other weights the most. That's all, uh, often what happens with indicator weights. The ones with the highest weights affect the other weights the most. Once you remove them, the other weights go up and then the p-values resolve themselves. The p-value problems have resolved themselves. Now you have more problems with this one, but we will fix this one as well. I'm, I'm going to show you. Uh, the results for this one as well, PLSM. So these are the results for PLSF. So what I did was I removed this indicator, I remove, removed this one, then I removed this one, and then this one, and then I got these results here. So this one took care of itself, the problem took care of itself, in other words. So ECM board that did not have to be removed. And here are the results before and after. So here I have the, the, the structural model results or the inner model results. So this is after fixing the problem with the formative latent variable. Now I have 12 indicators uh, only. Previously I had 16. And I have better fit with the data. So the S SRMR is lower. So generally speaking, these are the best results, which you would expect because you fix the problem with uh, formative measurement, the problems with formative measurement that you had in the formative latent variable. Now this is for PLSM. So in PLSM, I removed, uh, I removed this one, I removed this one, then I started removing the indicators uh, with the highest weights that had problematic p-values, so you would have been, uh, this one would have been the, the first. So I did this sequentially. And then I got this resolution. I ignored the, the WLS and the effect size problems, but they still remain. And uh, again, no surprise to me. Again, I, I, I don't want to, I know this is not the prevailing view, but a lot of people are, are more and more believing in this notion that uh, indicators cannot cause latent variables if they're designed to measure the latent variables. And this may be why we have these problems remaining with uh, a composite-based algorithm, PLSM, because I'm 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 not uh, I'm not uh, modeling uh, my my SEM model uh, with the latent variables seen as factors that cause the indicators. And here I have the PLSM results. Now fixing those problems with the formative variable led to a better uh, a lower SRMR, so it's better fit with the data. Uh, but again, a worse fit with the data than the factor-based algorithm. So here I have the final results for the composite classic PLS algorithm and the factor base algorithm. And here I have my main dependent variable success, right? I, I'm interested that this is, this is what interests me the most in the research. So this tends to be the case with factor based algorithms. The R squares tend to be a little bit higher than pure composite based algorithms. Now they are similar, the results here, because the latent variables, all of these four latent variables that I'm using, have high reliability. Uh, the true reliability is high. If re reliability was a little lower, um, the, there would be more of a discrepancy in the results. So I could have like say 0.51 here and 0.20 something here. Now they are similar because of, uh, because of the, uh, the high uh, reliabilities. Now this is one reason why people like to use PLS mode uh, B for formative measurement. Often the links associated with the formative variable they end up being higher. Uh, so this is the factor-based algorithm, the link is lower, but you know, just being higher doesn't mean that it's the right value, right? And the fit indices are telling me that these are the right values, not this one, not these values in, these, um, in this model on the left. Now for very difficult cases, you could use analytic composites where you would, you, you would go to this option, explore analytic composites and instrumental variables. You would create an analytic composite for uh, the, the uh, in, uh, aggregating the indicators um, that were problematic and also the other indicators in another analytic composite. And then you would use both of them in a second order 
uh, latent variable. And this tends to get, take care of difficult problems, difficult cases. And here, for the relative weights, I would use the original weights, which are not going to be the, the final weights, uh, because the final weights, uh, for, if you have fewer indicators, uh, you will have higher weights than your original uh, weights that you have with more indicators. So difficult, by difficult cases, I mean cases where you start applying those rules and removing indicators, and then all of a sudden you have, like we started with 16 indicators and now you have three, and, and they are still problematic. So you have to go to one indicator, then uh, then you, you completely lose the, the, the benefits of having uh, latent variables in your model if you have so few indicators uh, because of problematic cases. So you could use analytic composites to deal with uh, very difficult cases. So uh, with analytic composites, what you would do is you would create an AC and analytic composite with the offending indicators first, then another with the remaining indicators, and then use those two ACs as indicators of a new formative LV, which could be seen as a higher, second level, second order uh, formative LV. And that's what uh, I did here. And uh, I, as you can see, the, the analytic composites that I created, so individually, they, they all passed the criteria that I mentioned before, and the analytic composites themselves used as indicators also pass those criteria. And here I have the model results before and after with analytic composites. So I went from, uh, and this is for the factor-based algorithm, so I went from 16 indicators to two analytic composites being used as indicators, and this model has even better fit with the data than the previous models. I should say, though, that sometimes models have better fit with the data because they have fewer indicators overall. And so this tends to be uh, an effect uh, that you have to, to be mindful of. So in conclusion, uh, latent constructs should cause indicators, even in formative measurements. Therefore, factor algorithms should fit the data better in most cases. Formative measurement is normally assessed through weights, not loadings. The expectations, if you're going to be less conservative, you want the weights to, to have p-values associated with them that are significant at the 0.05 level, and VIFs lower than 3.3. And if you're going to be more conservative, you don't want any Simpsons paradox instance in your latent variable, and you want the effect sizes to be greater than 0.02. And analytic composites may be used in very difficult cases. Now, before I take questions, let me, uh, let me show you how to do that in Warp PLS. It's very easy. So here I have Warp PLS. Can you see it on the screen? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. So, uh, so I already entered my data. So I have my model here. This is the factor-based algorithm. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll fix possible problems in this formative variable. So uh, what I'll do is first I will view my indicator weights. And as I can see, there are problems here. So some of the indicators, it's same same thing that I showed before on the slide. So I have indicators that have p-values that are non-significant. These three, I have VIFs that are too high. So I'm going to take care of those problems. I can actually I can even leave this open so that I can see uh, where the problems are. So I'm going to go to I'm going to go to this. Option define SEM model. I'm going to edit this latent variable. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of those indicators. So I'm going to get rid of email, ECM email list. Remove. I'm going to get rid of uh, this one here, ECM web page. I'm gonna get rid of, I, I'm just gonna do it because I know that uh, they, they, the problems will get fixed as I do more, rem two removals. So attach audio and uh, voice message will also be removed. So i remove them. Then I'll save these settings. I don't need this anymore. Then I'm gonna save my model. Okay, then I'm gonna redo the analysis. Here I have the new results. Then I go to the indicator weights. And now as I can see, all of my P values are lower than 0.05. All of the VIFs are lower than 3.3. And if you want to be strict, no, no negative WLS 
values, right? No, no, no Simpsons paradox instances, and no effect size problems. So we, I can then say that I can trust uh, my measurement model with respect to this formative LV, and therefore I can trust these structural model results uh, that I will report as supporting some of my hypotheses, but not all of them. So I, I, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll take any questions. Okay. Anyway, well, the, 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 question, the question I had here was, uh, and, and I think, in fact, your, your whole presentation to some extent uh, went in the direction of answering it, but it, what, uh, what was the reason for you to develop Warp PLS? What were the problems with traditional PLS software that bothered you the most? Well, the main problem with, uh, with classic PLS, and this is, a ma this is a major criticism of classic PLS uh, algorithm that is composite-based, is that uh, you, you uh, tend to overestimate um, zero paths, right? So you get false positives in your analysis, and you underestimate the um, the, the real paths, and uh, that can lead to to false negatives or type two errors, right? So you have type one errors and type two errors, and that has been the main criticism of uh, classic PLS, uh, which is not factor based. Um, and that is the main reason why pe many people say, well, you should not use PLS to do SEM, you should use CBSEM. You should do, use uh, full information, maximum likelihood, maximum likelihood methods and variations. So that's the reason. It's a problem that exists. And uh, when you do Monte Carlo simulations, Monte Carlo simulations are experiments where you create data that you know the results. And when you do Monte Carlo simulations, you know the lack of precision of uh, classic PLS. And the reason is that classic PLS does not take into consideration that measurement residual or measurement error that I mentioned before in my presentation that emerges when you have factors causing the indicators. And I think that is all, it all comes down to this problem that I explained, which is that indicators cannot cause factors. And even if you don't use the formative mode um, of uh, classic PLS, the mode B, uh, even if you use mode A to, to, uh, to model uh, formative LVs, you still have the problem that it's a composite. So you don't have that measurement uh, residual. And the measurement residual do, does exist. And so it's just not modeled. And then you have these feet indices too. I mean, I, I, I look at, at a lot of empirical data. I must have seen uh, literally hundreds of empirical studies and they tend to have, the, the composite based algorithms tend to have uh, lower, less, less good a fit with the data than the factor based algorithms that we have. Now, I should say one thing, though, that um, there are some folks that are saying, okay, classic PLS, composite base may not be so good for, for explanation, for SEM, for model testing, but it's, it's good for prediction, right? Now, that may or may not be true. And uh, if, you, if you come up with a solution for prediction, there is a very good space to try, and that's the financial markets, right? The, particularly the stock market. So if you can predict the future based on the past, um, you may be the uh, first trillionaire uh, in the world. So whenever people tell me, oh, I have this uh, method that is very good for prediction, um, I tend to be suspicious because no one can predict the future, right? Even though everybody tries, and uh, in the financial markets and the financial media, it's even funny, right? They, they uh, interview experts and the expert will say, oh yeah, this is gonna happen. The market is gonna go up tomorrow and this company is gonna go up and so on. And quite often they're completely wrong. So no one can predict yeah. the future, right? Uh, in, so, in, in, the, in the past, I remember that you were looking for the Holy Grail. It was, I, I remember, I believe that it was related to this, right? Trying to predict the future, wasn't it? Uh, no, you said I, that maybe that's where you wanted to reach with your research in, in structural equations and PLS and things like that. Holy Grail could be, uh, you know, solving the common method bias problem. Causality assessment would be uh, Holy Grail, right? So if you could look at this uh, model and tell, well, the causality, uh, the directions of causality that you specified here, they're all correct. If you could test it, I think that would be the Holy Grail in this type of analysis as well. And for prediction, the Holy Grail is predicting the stock market. Uh, predicting the weather may also be uh, uh, something that, that would be... Uh, something that very good but you know if you could predict the, the market you would get a lot of funding 
coming your way to do even more of that. Now, but I should say this, prediction is not the same as SEM, right? So with SEM, you analyze empirical samples that you assume come from the population and a population that is much larger than your sample. So what you do is you analyze your sample and try to extrapolate to the population. The population could be the entire population of humans on the face of the earth, eight point something uh, billion people. Whereas prediction is different. So when you do prediction, typically you want to analyze one sample to predict a very similar sample. So you want to analyze purchases in a supermarket, for example, in one month to predict the sales, the purchases in the uh, next month. Those samples are very similar. So that you're not trying to go from the sample to the population, which is SEM. That's how you test theory. You do structural equation modeling. Uh, prediction is not testing theory. Hypothesis testing is not really uh, prediction. But there is a, a whole group that are moving toward that direction. And uh, so they're not too concerned about factor-based uh, PLS, SEM, or, or what, what have you. And uh, yeah, it's just a direction that a group of research is taking. Okay, any other questions? Yes, we have. Uh, maybe someone has, uh, if, if anyone has to express themselves by means of voice, please do. I have several questions here. Uh, I'm not going to show them. I'm going to just to read them, uh, Ned, because that when I try to, oh, when okay. I try to, to, to open my, to, to, to open my screen here again, my computer went crazy, right? But anyway, does anyone want to say anything? Uh, there, feel free, you know? Okay. Let me just check here what I have. Uh, okay, I have a question here. Ned, I'm, I'm still struggling to understand how the formative and reflective constructs can work together. Does warp PLS treat them differently? In PLS mode M, yes. Um, so if you use PLS mode M, which you would set here, so this is the factor base. So if I were to change PLS mode M, then the software would, would treat formative LVs with PLS mode B and the reflective LVs with PLS mode A. So then the formative LVs would be treated differently. Uh, and that's PLS mode M, which is the, 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 the classic PLS algorithm that most of the software implement. Now, uh, and I have a few other options here. They're explained in, a, in the user manual for what PLS, which you can get easily. But when you, if you were to select PLS mode A, then all variables are treated using PLS mode A, all LVs. And if you choose PLS mode B, then all LVs are treated, um, are treated in the, in the, uh, using the formative mode, which is mode B. Now, with okay. the factor-based algorithm, then uh, all variables would be treated the same way, but they're not going to behave the same way because they're different. The difference of, uh, of formative variables is that the indicators you have, there are non-redundant. So formative variables, you don't have to treat them differently. They behave differently. Okay, uh, and another, another question still with respect to formative uh, constructs. What is the set of criteria indicated to evaluate the measurements model, structural model, and the effects F square and Q square in a model with only formative constructs? Uh, a model with only formative constructs? Well, that a model with only formative constructs, uh, I guess the, the criteria that you would use for each one of the latent variables would be the criteria that... Uh, that we, we discussed uh, previously for each one of them, right? So you would look at weights and uh, for each one of the variables, you look at the indicator weights and uh, you would look at lack of redundancy. You would want to make sure that they're non-redundant, that the p-values are lower than 0.05, et cetera. By the way, I should say that for reflective variables, you can have VIFs that are high because there is no problem with redundancy there. Now the R squared coefficients, um, what I would recommend is an R squared that is uh, 0.2 or higher because that would be one that would be significant with a sample size of a reasonable uh, uh, level. And uh, so, because the software generates P values for your R squared. So the, the software generates these uh, fit indices, uh, they're structural model based. And one of them is the average R squared and you would generate a p-value for it. Now, if you have a model where you have only one endogenous LV or only one dependent LV, you will also have a p-value. And you will tend to be significant if your sample size is of reasonable size. And that, I would say that would be 160 or so. Uh, then a, an R squared of 0.2 or higher will be significant.
By the way, you can assess whether you have uh, a, an appropriate sample size uh, based on the model. So uh, normally what I would recommend is take a look at your uh, uh, lowest significant, P lower than uh, 0 0.05 or significant, lowest significant path coefficient in the model. So since this one is exactly 0 0.05, I would take the lowest is this, 0.30. So if you go to the option Explore, Statistical Power and Minimum Sample Size Requirements, and you enter that 0.30 there, you'll get your minimum sample size. You get two methods, the gamma exponential and the inverse square root. This is more conservative, so I would recommend reporting both in papers, but try to meet this one. 69. So in our case, since we have 300, um, 300 teams that we studied, so our N is 300, is way higher than what I need. Now, if you don't enter anything here, the software will give you uh, the, the, it's explained in the manual why this default um, value is entered here, but then it gives you that 160 that I mentioned before. So if you're going to do an analysis and you don't know um, the, the size of the path coefficients that you should expect, which you could based on prior research, but let's say you don't know, then I would recommend starting with 160 and then increasing it based on um, the results of your analysis. Okay, uh, all right. And another question still, Ned, uh, do you need to do any assumption about variables, probability or density distributions? No, not with, uh, with these algorithms. They are very, uh, they are very, um, robust to deviations uh, to normality and in fact uh, most data is non-normal right so if you go here to data and then uh, correlations and descriptive statistics for indicators uh, the software gives you the results of um, two tests of normality the archi beta test and the robust archi beta test and as you can see is no 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 almost all of them are non-normal uh, they tend to they tend to deviate from uh, normality so now, why is that? It's because in, uh, in this method, factor-based PLS and also classic PLS, the latent variables, they are calculated as aggregations of the indicators. So you take um, the, the, the indicators as they are, no normal or normal, and then you deal with them directly. Now, uh, in CBSCM, you don't generate latent variable scores, by the way. Yeah, many people don't know that, but CBSCM, you do not generate the LVs. You can generate them at the end, but you don't typically do that in your estimation process. What you generate is the indicator correlation matrix, the model implied, which you, or the indicator covariance matrix, the model implied, and then you fit that to the actual uh, indicator covariance matrix. So. Since you don't have, you don't use the indicators, you have just the correlations. And the correlations are just one characteristic of your data. Uh, skewness and kurtosis are two other characteristics. But if you have only the correlations or the covariances, you, you have to assume a, a distribution uh, for your indicators. And the default assumption in CBSCM is normal, that they are all normally distributed. Having said that, it doesn't affect the results that much. It does affect some, but not much. But yeah, uh, these methods that I described here, they are robust to, uh, to deviations from normality. But of course, the composite-based ones, they're less precise. Okay, uh, I don't see any. Does anyone have any question that you want to express or so? I mean, just open your mics there and, and, and ask directly to Matt. Hello. Um, nice meeting you, Ned. Uh, I'm Jose Robles from, uh, from Peru. From Esan University, um, and, and thank you very much for your for your presentation. Um, I, I wanted to ask you because uh, probably uh, many of us in here are uh, a, a bit um, uh, I don't know how to say scared <laughs> because because um, because of maybe we believe that there is a lot of math behind and there is I know there is, but my question for you is is more of on the practical side. How much math and statistics? you you believe we need to know in order to use uh tools like like the one you you presented today well i, I teach uh in the doctoral program here i teach sem and, and and i teach both and and most of the students do not have a very strong mathematical background and so they learn how to use tools like rpls and interpret the results and uh i think that is is enough 
Uh, I don't think people should expect to have a very good command of the underlying mathematics, which is very difficult indeed. Uh, it seems clear to me, but uh, it took me a while uh, to, to feel comfortable with it. And uh, but I don't think I don't think that's reasonable for someone who is using the method to to want to understand all the mathematical statistics underlying it. And I should say the mathematical statistics is uh, even mathematicians don't like it very much because of the error terms. So mathematical statistics tends to be uh, perceived as difficult even by mathematicians. In fact, many mathematicians don't want it to be a branch of mathematics. They want it to be something else. Uh, because of the error terms, right? Uh, with error terms, you never have a correct solution. Uh, you, you minimize, if you don't have precise solutions, you always minimize errors, you, you maximize probabilities and so on. But no, I, I would say that if you were, you, if you were to go to warpls.com and uh, review the videos that are there, uh, you should have, have a working knowledge that will allow you to do, um, to do analysis. Now, you said you are from Peru. It reminded me of a friend here uh, at, at our university who retired recently from Peru, too. He used to work uh, for Booz Allen and Hamilton in Brazil. And uh, so he knew Peru and he knew Brazil. And uh, so I was department chair. I've been department chair here for a while. And uh, so sometimes you would come up with problems to me and uh, I would uh, say, well, let's solve it this way, that way. And then he would say, oh, de jeitinho brasileiro. Ned has uh, o jeitinho brasileiro uh, to, to solve problems. He was from Peru. He retired. He's in Austin now. Uh, Ned, one thing that I, I think related to the question that Jose uh, just asked you, uh, and, and that's one of my concerns. In fact, I used to be very quantitative here. Uh, but one of the reasons that made me less quantitative over time was that I see that many times people use quantitative tools without understanding them to the level that they should if they wanted to use them, right? right. Uh, and right. this is something that should be clear to our students. I mean, you, you don't have to understand the precise mathematics, uh, the, the details of the mathematics, but you have to have a very clear understanding of what each of the, the things uh, mean there, because otherwise you're just pressing buttons and the software is telling you results and you copy those results to, to papers and papers don't make sense to people that read it because you are not, uh, you, you don't have the, the, the yourself the, uh, enough understanding of that. So we have a lot of uh, graduate students uh, that are here with us today that are still master students. And uh, I hope that they were not scared by Stacey's presentation last week and Ned's presentation today. In fact, we only chose to do this because we know that we're recording this. And, and those of you who want to be more quantitative oriented, you can see this over, you can go there to the website, you can ch you can play with the, the, the software, you can uh, see this again and again until you feel comfortable because I mean, Statistical tools have been used a lot in academia, in information science, in information systems, and in other business and computer science uh, uh, fields uh, to sort of stop people from complaining about your paper because even the reviewers sometimes don't understand. And I, I feel that half the times the reviewers don't understand because the author, him or herself, was not very clear about what they were, do they were doing. So please be very professional. Only use tools that you master, at least to the sense that you are able to explain uh, the uh, the, 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 the general uh, idea of what you're doing and you're confident with the results that you're getting. One comment I would make on this is that um, it's a, uh, so, so a couple of comments. One is that this tool that we're discussing here, SEM, uh, the, the methodological tool SEM, is probably the most advanced you have uh, quantitative analysis method that you typically use in business, except for time series analysis, which is more in the uh, econometrics. econometrics, yeah. econometrics. So this is probably the most advanced type of tool that you can use in, in, in business research and management, marketing, MIS, uh, IS, and so on. And uh, if you want to have the, the world as your job market, uh, it would be difficult. It, you would handicap yourself a little bit not knowing this tool, right? It doesn't mean that you have to use it only. I actually think it's a good idea to do qualitative and quantitative research and then combine the results. But uh, another comment that I would make is more philosophical. And uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, situation with Charles Darwin, right? So Charles Darwin, when he developed the theory of evolution, there was no mathematics in it. Uh, and he didn't even know about the work of the Catholic priest uh, Mendel on genetics. And uh, so there was no mathematics. And then um, Darwin, just through verbal arguments, uh, expose himself to a lot of difficulty uh, 
defending the theory, right? So there were a number of problems. One is that uh, the, the costly traits, right? Costly traits evolve in nature. So you have traits that are detrimental to survival and, uh, and evolve also. Uh, the peacock's tail, for example, the peacock's train, right? So that big train, the peacock, the male peacock uh, has, it's not beneficial for survival, it's detrimental for survival. So Darwin could not just make sense of that, uh, of those uh, criticisms. And then the essentially the theory of evolution fell in disrepute and was essentially forgotten until the 19, early 1900s, where folks with a very strong mathematical background merged it with genetics, Mendelian genetics. And for that, they, they had to develop new methods. And one of the methods is path analysis uh, developed by Sewell Wright, which is the foundation of structural equation modeling. And in path models, you can see through the numbers very clearly how a uh, costly trait would develop. Uh, by the way, if people th would think that evolution maximizes survival, then where, where are the immortals, right? Where are the immortal people? So it doesn't maximize survival. It maximizes reproductive success of selfish genes. But the point that I'm making is a bit more philosophical is that here you have one of the greatest scholars of all time benefited later posthumously from a, a more mathematical view of, uh, of evolution. And it's very difficult to understand evolution without a mathematical view. Yeah, don't get me wrong. When I when I when I say that I sort bent it the other way and started doing more qualitative research, uh, I completely agree with you. I just my 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 argument here is that uh, if you want to go that way, and and, and maybe Ned is already answering one of those questions that I want to ask him later about international careers and everything. Uh, he already says if you're going to to if you plan that, and mainly if you plan to do that in the United States, I would say definitely definitely you have to be very good quantitatively. Maybe in Europe, uh, you you would have a a less Mendelian and a more uh, Darwinist approach would, would be acceptable. Uh, but in the States, for sure, uh, uh, you, you have to be more quantitative. Uh, any other questions still with respect to, to, to Ned's uh, uh, presentation and work PLS? If not, Ned, uh, I, I, I wanted to, to uh, use this, considering that it's difficult for most of our students here to have this opportunity to talk to, talk to someone who, who's developed uh, their career uh, Outside, has studied most of the time in Brazil. I think you, you took your PhD in, in, in New Zealand, but up to, at least up to your master's, it was in Brazil. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit or, or tell them, people that are still thinking about where what, what they want to do about their careers in, in research or in academia. Uh, maybe tell you tell us a little bit about your path. What was, what was good, what was bad about it? Just a little bit about your experience uh, being a Latin American researcher who's, uh, who's worked most of the time outside Latin America. Yeah, well, I was uh, even before that. I was at uh, at the military school, right? So I attended uh, SpaceX SpaceX in Campinas um, for three years. That during the time it was high school, right? Um, it, uh, today I think it's just a precursor to AMA. But at that time, uh, the, the time I attended, uh, my my class was one of the one of the last classes there that had uh, the three years. And uh, most of my colleagues uh, who, who continued in the military career, they I'm are probably now friends of the president here, right? Yeah, there is one general that I know, actually the best friend, my, my best friend at SpaceX, uh, or, or one of my best friends, uh, Luciano Batista de Lima, he is uh, General de Brigada. Mm -hmm. But I think there are more generals, uh, if they're not, they already retired, they retired as lieutenant colonels or, or colonels, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I studied there before I went to the Cefetch. Um, Paraná, which has a different name, Universidade Tecnológica Federal do Paraná, agora, right? And that's another one that uh, is outstanding, outstanding education we got there, even with the filters, right? What was the name of that guy in calculus that <laughs> failed almost everybody? Um, you know, better, better not mention it. Uh, maybe there are people that know him. Yeah, I, I remember the, you. But... Yeah, there were the filters. It was a very tough program, tougher than anything I, I've, I've ever did. Well, the, the military school was tough, too. The military school was uh, amazing that, uh, you know, people, many people years after had the same dream that they did not pass a year, which was the terror of everybody. Because you, if you didn't pass a, a year, you were a rep. So then you were um, a subordinate to your colleagues that advanced. And if you fail second year, you're out. So it was a, like a terror. So very tough. Then engineering at uh, Cefetch Paraná, excellent program, very difficult. 
engineering programs tend to be very difficult anyways, right? especially electrical engineering with complex numbers and uh, circuits and so on. Then I went to uh, ETA in San Jose Campus, did my master's in computer science. That was kind of a, an easy one compared to Cefetch, to be frank with you, compared to engineering. Uh, in part because I was already, I already had a company that developed software. So I was already doing a lot of software development before joining that program at uh, ETA, Institute of Techn Technological Aeronautica. That opened the door to the world because um, many people from other countries go there into places like USP, GV to recruit into their PhD program. So when I was there at ETA, I applied for a few uh, scholarships in, in some places, ended up in New Zealand. It's a very good scholarship. Uh, and uh, I almost, well, my plan was to come back to Brazil, but there was a problem with uh, uh, the offer that I received and it was it was a confusion. Then I almost stayed in, in New Zealand uh, or, or Australia, I had offers in Australia. And then uh, I, en I came to a conference in the US in Cleveland um, and I participated in the doctor consortium as well as I presented in the conference. The doctoral consortium, I think, was organized by Wanda Olikowski, uh, who is at the MIT, is an MIS professor, brilliant MIS professor, who is at the MIT today. And uh, then in the conference, I ended up getting a couple of offers right there from people who, who were recruiting. It was a good time to be in the market at the time. That was 96, 1996. And then I, I just ended up here by chance, pretty much. Uh, first, I went to Temple University in Philadelphia, then Lehigh University, a small private university north of Philadelphia. And uh, during the, that time, I already wanted to come to a Latin area of the United States, so either Southern California, Southern, uh, southern uh, Texas, or, or Southern Florida, right? I, I wish there was an area here that was really close to, the, to Brazil, right? So you could cross into Brazil and do things there but no such luck, I guess the area where you have most um, people from Brazil of these uh, three that I mentioned would be Southern Florida, maybe Miami. But I ended up, uh, you know, the, the position here at the university opened up, they were starting a PhD program. So I liked, I came and uh, been here, it's been pretty much uh, uh, by chance, to be frank with you, uh, coming here and staying here. Uh, being here, I can tell you that if you if you're and I tell our doctor students, you really need the, the, to be very strong in quantitative methods here in the U.S. because of the U.S. market, right? Even though there are people that do only qualitative interpretive research or theoretical research, right? Uh, I mean, Wanda herself does a lot of uh, theoretical work, and she's very good at that. And then she is a full professor, endowed professor at MIT. So, but again, uh, again, I think she's from a different generation, right? Maybe it could be. Yeah more difficult for her to start and, and start from and doing what she does today or, or she did over the, the years if she, if she had to start right now in the States. Yeah, she was. Uh, she had a hard time and there were a number of people that were doing similar things, right? My initial uh, research, but well, I had, as you know, I had this uh, very strong mathematical background from, uh, from engineering and from computer science. Um, but I started, my PhD was actually action research because it's uh, quite popular in Australasia, right? Australia, New Zealand, and also uh, Scandinavian countries in England, and also England. So it's quite popular uh, in, in uh, these uh, places, in some, in some of these places. And so I did an action research project and I thought it was like the insights that I got from doing action research were quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I could see problems that I, I generated by participating in the organization that I was studying. So, but I always had that, uh, that uh, positivist mindset because it's tough to do fully, completely uh, uh, interpretive research. Mainly when you come from an engineering background like we did, right? Well, not only that, I mean, if you do, let's say you do grounded theory to analyze your text data, uh, open coding is the first step, and it's very hard for you to have different people come up with the same results in open coding. So that was a challenge. So I always felt that even action research, uh, if you could do, uh, if you could start with hypothesis and then use a most post, uh, more like a post-positivist approach to analyze your data in an interpretive way, in, interpretive way, together with quantitative analysis, I thought that that was the, the, the best uh, scenario for research. 
okay, very interesting. Uh, people, anyone, uh, now we're talking about his life, we're not talking about uh, his theory or, or, or his, his tool any longer. So even if you were uh, people that uh, didn't feel that you have still uh, this, the, the possibility of asking stronger questions about the, 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 the tool, the technology, uh, this is the time you have to ask. Again, it's a Latin American researcher who's gone abroad. If you're planning to do that, uh, you know, anyone feel free. The mic is open. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, I'm Andre. I'm from UFABC. <laughs> I'm a master student. Uh, in the beginning, you were saying about uh, how you could use blockchain to vote. And I'm quite interested in blockchain. I, I my, my research isn't related to, <laughs> to blockchain. But uh, uh, how do you think that people would react if such a system were, uh, were like, proposed, at least? <laughs> well, the problem, that the problem uh, with... Uh... So I, I actually, I don't know enough about the blockchain technology to really tell you that, uh, you know, I believe it's, it's, it's invulnerable. But uh, the problem with elections here, and this is why they are paper-based, is that they, they want the evidence. In case there is a need for a recount, they want the paper evidence of the votes uh, to, to deal with the recounts. And anything electronic, by the way, it was more popular uh, here, uh, a few years back, electronic voting, and uh, now it's much less popular because of the belief that you can uh, tamper with the system. And these were booths that they would have in the in the voting centers. So you would go there physically and vote using the the system. Um, so it's the, the I don't think this will be uh, accepted very soon. But it seems to be the trend of the future, right? Since it is used for, I mean, many, many countries are considering cryptocurrencies, right? China was the one that uh, recently talked about it uh, and, and having their own cryptocurrency it would not be Bitcoin or Ethereum. It would be their own um, yuan that they would, uh, they would uh, print. They would not have more uh, coins or, or paper-based money in circulation and everybody would have uh, an electronic wallet and so on. So we're moving in, the, in that direction. And if you, are, if you think that it's safe to manage your money that way, why not voting, right? But I think it's a still some time away. Um, and you see the election now in the US, uh, they're both uh, saying that there will be uh, a need for recount, more Trump than Biden, but they're both saying that there may be a need for recounts because uh, the, the votes are very close and so on. So. Yeah, it's. I don't think it will be adopted soon. I may be wrong. No, yeah. If you compare to Brazil, that we use this crazy electronic vote system, but it's not really that secure. And you compare it to blockchain. I think, I, in my opinion, at least, blockchain is a bit more transparent. You can like see the technology for yourself. And the Brazilian elections, you can't really see the code for yourself. And I, I don't know how people would accept the the, the concept of the blockchain because sort of the historical problems here in Brazil. But uh, I don't know how people see it there in the US. But I, I think people are really like, they don't trust the technology. Yeah, yeah, they are here. There is opposition to that, right? There is even opposition to electronic voting uh, you, in, the, in the voting uh, centers. So I don't think, uh, I don't think we're gonna see uh, voting from home using our computer anytime soon. Uh, and if, if you don't mind to talk uh, about your experience, uh, in the beginning, when you were starting your career in modeling systems, uh, did you find it difficult to propose anything or to, how to start in the, the beginning of the, the first papers? How did you find? Well, it's well. I, I I've had uh, publications in three main different areas. I would say, uh, action research. It went well. I, I was able to publish in uh, in good journals. Um, then I published in Evolution, Applied to um, Information Systems. In fact, I developed a theory called Media Naturalist Theory that uh, is, has a lot of citations to it. There is even a Wikipedia article, which I did not create. I did not create that article. And, um, and then I entered this uh, space in part because of the connection with evolution, because I studied the mathematical population genetics, which is the only way to understand evolutionary phenomena is to really understand it mathematically. So you, you use population genetics and one of the tools is path analysis, right? And SEM is uh, structural equation modeling with path analysis. So I started doing work on this, but I've been doing it for years. And now that the results are, are, are coming up uh, in terms of publications, 
but whenever you enter a new space that, that there are other people that already made their careers in that space, uh, you, you face opposition. Uh, so they're the gatekeepers, right? Yeah, they're the gatekeepers. So for example, this factor based uh, uh, PLS SEM approach that I developed, uh, it's, it solves arguably a 100 year old problem. This has been a problem since the beginning when people started talking about factors, uh, which dates back to the, the early 1900s. So um, then uh, I remember I, I, I was at a conference and I told uh, one person that is very well known in this field. And the person looked at me like, how, how could you have developed this solution, right? But you see, it, it, I, I like to follow the example of the great scholars. So take Isaac Newton, for example. Isaac Newton started doing research in optics and making advances. By the way, I'm not comparing myself with uh, Newton. Okay, nor not with ice and any, any of these folks, but you could follow their example. So look at Isaac Newton, started doing research in optics, and then the gatekeepers basically uh, tried to, uh, um, you know, end his career early. Then what did he do? He developed the mirror telescope. That was a major invention. And then everybody started taking him seriously. Right. So in this space, I follow Newton's example and I developed the software. And uh, since it's out there and the, the gatekeepers, people have been doing research on this, they can go and try the software. If it was fraudulent, if it was generating coefficients that were bizarre, non-real coefficients, they would they would publish an article, uh, you know, uh, showing to the world this person, Ned Koch, who is committing fraud. Um, there in Texas. No, they, they, it's out there. They they can see it works. Uh, even with these fit indices, right? They show you that, uh, yeah, the, the factor-based approach tends to fit the data better. So it ends up being a way of handling, but you have to be, you have to be sort of a, have thick skin, especially you, you when you- use Steve Alter's uh, theory, you, 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 you do the work around. Yeah, and uh, it's always easier to criticize others than to solve a really difficult problem. Say common method bias. Whoever solves common method bias statistically, uh, numerically, would be solving an amazingly difficult problem. So whoever tries to do that and does it will get a lot of criticism uh, after publishing the solution because providing the critique is how some people build their careers. So there are people that just pay attention to the new developments and then they write a critique. So you you work like for 10 years and then you get a, a quarterly publication and uh, then you have a person that writes one critique or gets that publication in the quarter, your RSR, Information System Journal, wherever, Journal of the AIS. So it's always easy to publish if you are a critic than if you are the one solving problems. But I think in the long run, the recognition comes, but it takes time. Thanks, man. That was great. Okay. Any other questions? Well, if not, well, Ned, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure talking to you. It's uh, great whenever I see you. I remember some some good times of our, our lives. Not that the times that we have today are not good, but it was uh, really great having you here with us. And thank you very much for supporting this Latin American community of IS researchers. I think we are, with this research seminars here, we are starting a trend that hopefully uh, will go on for many years of collaboration among uh, researchers in the in the field in, in this in this part of the, the the world and also with the support and help of people who are in in, in other uh, let's say communities that have developed uh, further than than we have so far thank you very much you also so, thank you have a good day thank you buen dia thank you buen dia and by the way one thing that i forgot but we've been doing lately is uh, whoever ha can open their cameras maybe uh, if that if you can uh, close your presentation and they whoever can open their cameras we we shoot a photo so that we can tell other people that we were here today okay so very quickly, if whoever has a, uh, their, their, their cameras and can open their cameras, please do it. And we will try to do that very difficult task of, of pressing print screen. Please do it yourselves also so that we can have this in, in uh, with, uh, you know, it, I mean, it, you can share it in Facebook, Instagram, whatever. I don't know. We still see you didn't scare that many people. We're still more than 40 people in the in this call. And now uh, we can print screen it. All smile. Okay. Well, see you guys next week. Thank you very much again, Ned. It was great having you with us. Ciao. 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 Uh, this is the uh, Google Meet.
it, right. it has the camera and it has the speaker as well, right? So it will show your camera, your 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 screen, uh, and it will also show you. So uh, don't do what uh, a judge did the other day here in Brazil. He stood up from his chair and he was with his underwear, right? So, <laughs> so, so if that's the case, be sure that you're in the right frame there. <laughs> right. No, that's not going to be a problem here. No. Okay. I okay. am. Well, pleased to know that. I'm in my office here at the university.